Ons wil allemaal baie hartelijk welkom hier bij weer die jaarlijkse conferentie van die van die FBD Tech Stichting. Uh, Ambassador Schaefer, Mr. and Mrs. De Kluf, honored guests, our co-hosts from the Conrad Adenauer Foundation. I would like to welcome you all to what for us is a, a very special occasion, a conference to mark and celebrate the 30th anniversary of the speech that F.W. de Klerk gave on the 2nd of February 1990 that changed the course of South African history. The American author, Kurt Vonnegut, coined a word in one of his science fiction novels. It was Wampeter. And a Wampeter was a junction in human destiny where taking one direction leads to one destination and another direction leads to a completely different destination. Well, 2nd of February 1990 was a Wampeter. And it changed the course of history of South Africa dramatically and overwhelmingly for the, for the, for the better. We want to look at that process today. Uh, Ambassador uh, Martin Schaeffer of the Federal Republic of Germany will speak about the historic developments that were taking place in Germany at that time. The fall of the Berlin Wall on the 9th of November 1989, the imminent collapse of the Soviet Union. These events also had reverberations around the world and were a, a significant factor in what happened in South Africa. Then we're going to uh, listen to Tian uh, Skidov, who's the chairman of our board of advisors, who was also in the secretariat of the organization that ran the constitutional negotiations. And they were perhaps one of the most successful peace processes in recent history. And, and Dunes will tell us more about the inner workings of that process. Then, Modetsi uh, Mbeki later will give us his unique view of where South Africa is today. We will, we will also have the, the great pleasure of having Gwen and Gwenya, the DA's head of policy, to talk about constitutional democracy, the continuation of the, the spirit of the 2nd of February 1990 into the future. Where is our constitutional democracy going? And then finally, F.W. de Klerk will give his own perspective of the last 30 years. The successes, the failures, the prospects for the future. So I would like to welcome you all once again. I hope we have a, a very interesting and stimulating uh, day. We're going to have a couple of panel discussions, so we will also be exchanging ideas on these important developments. And with that, I would like to ask uh, Annie Sir, the head of the Conrad Hardenau Foundation in South Africa, to say a few words from the perspective of our much valued co hosts. Thank you, Dave. Mr. and Mrs. de Klerk, um, Dr. Martin Schaefer, the ambassador from my home country, Germany. Uh, dear Moletsi Mbeki, dear Tirns, Gwen Gwenya, um, I think we have a great panel today. Uh, distinguished friends and uh, partners from the FW de Klerk Foundation, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, I would like to welcome all of you, and I also would like to take the opportunity to send President de Klerk and all the staff of the FW de Klerk Foundation the warmest regards of the chairman of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, Dr. Norbert Lammert, uh, who is the former president of the German Bundestag and who will visit Cape Town next month and he's looking very much forward to this visit. On February 2nd, 
we celebrate 30 years of the announcement of the end of apartheid. It was President de Klerk who in his speech in front of Parliament opened the door to the transformation of this country. The pace he set was impressive. Unbundling the apartheid regime was not without risk because it was anything but sure that the unexpected developments his decision might unleash. Many leaders from around the world applauded him, and history has proved his decision right. Traversing the tense situations of the early 1990s, South Africa fortunately developed in the right direction. The transition towards a democratic system was negotiated, and a new constitution inaugurated, which still is seen as very progressive. Considering all the things which that might have gone wrong, I think that the South African transition was a great success. Political transformations are never easy. In many cases, they went horribly wrong. Some countries found themselves in a political deadlock and even up, ended up in a civil war. But not so in South Africa, where President de Klerk, <coughs> President Mandela, and many other great South African leaders took the decision to sit down together and negotiate. In an environment of distrust, it's not easy to reach out the hand towards a former enemy and formulate a new future for a country. Ladies and gentlemen, living as a foreigner uh, here in South Africa, I observe a lot of unhappiness at the moment among South Africans <coughs> about the state of current political affairs and the way the country is developing. The economic outlook is poor, Social tensions are rising and government is failing to deliver the basic needs of the people. Let me not be misunderstood. South Africans are better off today than 30 years ago. Apartheid systematic and institutional injury to human dignity has been dismantled. However, human dignity remains elusive for most of the country's people. Most suffer from the lived experience of exclusion, gross inequality, poverty, and unemployment. Hope is an ever shorter supply. These factors, together with the constant news about corruption, misuse of public funds, and incompetence, are too overwhelming to believe that the government is on the right track. It's no wonder that the ANC's approval rate is declining, and I would be surprised if in the 2024 elections, the ANC will fail to win the absolute majority. On the other hand, the opposition isn't performing well either. The resignation of Musi Maimani and Herman Mashaba turned out to be the image disaster for the DA. The party lacks support amongst many voter groups and its liberal message is difficult to sell in a country of high inequality. The rising political entity appears to be the EFF, which uses its aggressive radical left-wing rhetoric to divide the people instead of bringing them together. I consider this party a threat to South African democracy in its current state. Beyond the EFF, other small opposition parties fail to make their voices heard and therefore are not widening the voter base. In view of the current political party landscape, it's no wonder that the biggest voter group is, by far, the one of the non-voters. In the 2019 elections, only three quarters of South Africans registered to vote, and out of them, only two thirds actually went out to cast a ballot. That results effectively in a voter turnout of just 50%. In other words, South Africans are increasingly opting out of party politics, and this raises questions over the system's legitimacy, given that the people are generally interested in politics, and also not reluctant at all to articulate an opinion. Nelson Mandela and the libera liber sorry, liberation movements fought so long for the right to vote, but today many people are not participating in elections anymore. Politicians should be worried if they fail to reach out to the people. They either have to improve the outcome of the politics or they have to improve, improve the communication. Probably both is the case. With the decline of the traditional political parties, new political forces and arrangements emerge. This is particularly true for the ANC, 
The more the formal liberation movement loses support, the more we enter in the stage of coalition politics. I still read opinion articles here in South Africa um, arguing that coalitions won't work. Uh, but even if true, um, there is no alternative, simply because the coalition government is the product of an election. In other terms, it's a product of the will of uh, the voters, and this is called democracy. The other, the South African electoral system actually promotes the fragmentation of the political party landscape. Hence, we will have to get used to coalition politics, which require a high level of political maturity and willingness to cooperate pragmatically with one's, sometimes with one's political opponent. Ladies and gentlemen, South Africa has huge challenges ahead. Public debt is rising, the government is failing to resolve the problems at state-owned enterprises, corruption is still endemic, service delivery is insufficient, the economy is struggling, unemployment is high, social tensions are rising, level of crimes are high, education is poor, and climate change will hit this country very, very hard. Most of these problems are of political nature, though. That means they have to be resolved politically. 30 years after the historic speech of President de Klerk and the release of Nelson Mandela, South Africa again needs decision makers who are willing to take the risk of bold decisions and to cooperate once in a while with a political opponent. The wonderful South African constitutions shows the path, path on how to do it, and that is also why there is no need at all to amend it. We have to stick to the constitution and make it work. We have to fill it with life and live its values. <clears throat> Democracy is about building bridges between people, not to separate them. We need to support those bridge builders, and it would be great if voters keep that in mind when they cast their ballot. The sooner the people find each other, the easier it will be to find solutions for the challenges ahead. <laughs> As a friend of this country and all its people, the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung supports South Africa in consolidating its constitutional democracy and the rule of law. We are delighted to partner with the FW de Klerk Foundation to pursue these common goals. I would like to thank you for the good cooperation we had over the years. And with these words, I would like to conclude my remarks and I wish you a very interesting conference, very interesting insights we are going to hear. And thank you very much for your attention. I would now like to invite Ambassador uh, Martin Schaefer to address us uh, on the topic of the linkage between developments in South Africa and Germany early in 1999. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. President de Klerk. This is the clerk, Mr. Dave Stewart. As the chairman of the Board of Trustees, Mr. Tons Edelf, as the chairman of the Board of Advisors of the FW de Klerk Foundation, <laughs> the CEO, where is he? The CEO <coughs> must be here, must be. This is Morkel, friends and partners of the FW de Klerk Foundation, Eva Henning Zur, and I'm glad to see so many friends people that I've spent time with in South Africa, like Maurice Ibeki and so many more. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning to you and thank you very much for the invitation to this auspicious and I think important event. It's an honor to be here with you and it's a pleasure to represent the state and the country and the nation here today that has a lot to share with uh, South Africa back a little bit later to that. I must say it was not very easy for me to be here today because I must tell you a secret. Uh, I have been dealing in recent days nearly entirely with the preparation of a rather big visit. And if you promise that you don't tell anybody, <laughs> <laughs> then I tell you that uh, next uh, Thursday, the Chancellor of the Federal Republic of Germany will be in South Africa. She will spend two nights and the day in South Africa, 
most of the time she will spend with uh, the successor of President de Klerk, with uh, Mr. Sir Ramaphosa. There's a lot to discuss on world affairs, on South Africa, on Germany, on Africa. And I'm very glad to see that the two leaders, one of the two of the most eminent leaders of the free world, I would say, one, two of the <coughs> leaders that strive to fight the fight against nationalism, against populism, and that fight to defend the rules-based world order that emerged after the Second World War will find enough time to uh, devise new strategies to fight this fight uh, successfully. <laughs> now these are strange and messy times, aren't it? that we live in. It seems as if the demons of the past, the zombies of the past, have come out of their graves. The nationalism, the populism that ravaged the continent that I come from, Europe. It is, it is as if the lessons from our past don't count anymore. And it's a phenom phenomenon, I think, that goes far beyond our world, the world that I come from, the Western world, if we look at the West, if we look at the East, certainly the East, if we look at the North of our planet, we see the demons and the zombies coming out, coming out again. And I think that is exactly why it is good that the leaders of our two nations meet, and that is, that is the reason why it is good that we have come together here on invitation of you, Minister, uh, President de Klerk, to discuss the future of this country and beyond, because we must never forget that the example and the history of South Africa, of what began on that day, the 2nd February of 1990, is not only important for South Africa. It is a beacon of hope for the entire world. So. You South Africans, you hold in your hands the destiny of your own country, and of your own nation, and of your own history. But you hold in your hand also maybe the biggest and most important example of peaceful change made by yourselves. I will want to come back a little bit later to that too. Um, a lot has been said, and I want to start by that, about, about you, President de Klerk. I'm not going to repeat everything that is true. You have received the Nobel Peace Prize. You have done so much for this country. From the perspective of my country, I personally just would like to say one thing that I think is, is important. For me, it is not only your foresight, it is not only your courage and your wisdom, it is not only the risks that you have taken to be called by your people a traitor, someone who betrays the values of what they thought, or what they thought were right. But what you did is you made sure that it was South Africans, South Africans from all walks of life, black and white, who decided about the future of your country. I wish I could say that about Germany. It needed the entire force of the world to bring down the Nazis, to bring down this evil regime that was war-mongering and that created the Holocaust. But here in South Africa, here in South Africa, the change that was necessary and the change that was overdue was brought about by South Africans. There was some contribution by foreign powers, by Margaret Thatcher, maybe by Helmut Kohl, and by others. And you, Mr. President, you will know that a lot better than all of us that are present, because you are the witness, you are the actor, you are the man who made it. But it was, and I want to repeat that, because I think that's important. You South Africans took your destiny, your history, into your hands, and it was you who brought about the peaceful change that we enjoy today. Now, um, I would like to start what I want to say um, 
with a couple of disclaimers. Uh, the first and the most important one is that I want to say that what was done in the name of Germany in the years between 1933 and 1945 is singular in human history. What was done in the name of my country, what was done by Germans, <coughs> is singular and cannot be compared to anything else. What we did was the worst possible crime of men against men. I think it's important to say that before I say what I want to say because I don't want to have any doubt whatsoever amongst you that I want to compare what happened in the name of Germany in the Holocaust and in the Second World War with what was South Africa between 1948 and 1990. And I want you, and that's my second disclaimer, I want you to bear with me because you asked for a German perspective and you will get a German perspective. And that means that uh, <coughs> Germans can be quite frank and kind of quite blunt, but that means also the Germans, we are very naive romanticists. That's the reason why we continue to enjoy today to read the poems of Friedrich Schiller or of Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. And we believe that the literary phase of the romanticism was the most beautiful that you can possibly imagine. And that means we are romanticists in politics too. We have a certain vision of the world and we want this vision to become true even if it comes across very naive. Now, and the third uh, uh, and uh, last disclaimer is what I want to share with you, Mr. President, is not necessarily one-on-one, 100% -on -one, the official view of my country, or of my state, of my nation. There is some personal elements in it that, uh, that I would like to share with you as someone who is from Germany, who was born at a certain moment of time, and who has spent now, who lives now his seventh year in South Africa, so has had enough time at least to make the attempt, Mr. President, to understand a very complicated and a very complex country that is yours. And that is why, Mr. Stewart, please allow me to enlarge just a little bit, just a little bit, what you, what you said and invited me to do today. I want indeed to talk about Germany and South Africa in that time, about a generation ago, when everything seemed possible. About the time from the 80s to the middle of the 90s, when South Africa changed forever, and when the world changed forever. And Germany, for that matter, changed forever, I hope. But I also want to talk about the way my country, my nation, managed to handle a very difficult and a shameful past. Now, if you allow me, I would like to start to talk now about uh, those moments in history from the 80s to the middle of the 90s. What, we, what, what was reality in South Africa, what was reality in a divided nation that was Germany with two states was or were different expressions of the Cold War, of an epic battle between East and West, between capitalism and socialism, uh, between uh, completely different systems that considered themselves to be enemies. It was the consequence of the Second World War, where the Allies had to join forces in order to bring the Germans down, but where those Allies were divided along ideological lines, actually right after the 8th of May 1945, the day of unconditional surrender of the German troops uh, at the end of the Second World War in Europe. And if you want, in the different ways, it was a time of wars. There was the literal wall that separated the German nation right in the middle of it because of the consequences of the Second World World War that we waged on the war or on the world. But South Africa was full of walls too, wasn't it? Walls all over the place. 
walls between black and white, walls between suburbs and uh, townships, walls between uh, the different uh, elements of uh, the nation that was South Africa at that time. And then something changed in the middle of the 80s. It was probably surprising to everyone that, that a new general secretary of the Soviet Union, Mr. Mikhail Gorbachev, took power, someone that nobody had on his, on his or her path. He was an unknown to us. And he acceded to the most important political post in the Soviet bloc. And all of a sudden, he started something that uh, many people grappled to understand. He called it perestroika and glasnost, transparency and openness, unheard of in the Soviet bloc. And still, I think many of us, most of us, and certainly myself, I was a young man at that time, we had no idea what that actually meant. And in the West, something changed too. Something changed in the way we looked at our history, in the way we looked at this confrontation between East and West. There was something in, in Germany that was called the Friedensbewegung. Peace movement, it was called, where people were appalled by the fact that they were under the risk of imminent Armageddon, of a third world war, because the superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, found reasons to uh, fight a war <coughs> amongst themselves. And that was Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela was, wasn't to be seen by anybody, he was in prison. But I'm uh, inclined to say that probably one of the most successful campaigns of pro political public relations, or propaganda if you want, was the Free Mandela campaign. And the Free Mandela campaign in Western Europe was a very important part of this change of mentalities <coughs> in the West. First in civil society, in churches, in peace movements, but then every year a little bit more also in the political leaderships of our countries. And uh, that, finally, that wind of change, first a small blow maybe, became a storm. And I'm, I don't want to dwell uh, and, uh, and tell you all the little elements of that history because we are all well aware of it, and I think for the purpose of what I want to tell you it's not important. This wind of change became a storm in 1989. The Iron Curtain was cut in July. First in Hungary, where a couple of thousand people from East Germany who were having their vacations there grasped the opportunity to leave the Soviet bloc, flee East Germany and come to the West. And even at that moment, I must say, I was a young man of 18 years, I didn't really understand what that really meant, what change was about to come. And then only, only um, four months later, after in South Africa, you, Mr. De Klerk, had become the head of state of the Republic of South Africa, the wall came down in Berlin. And if there's one symbol, if there's one symbol for the change in the world at the end of the 80s, it was that night, the night of the 9th to the 10th of November 1989, when the people of East Germany were finally fed up with the regime of 40 years of oppression, repression, and uh, limits to their freedoms. That started before with the Monday demonstrations in Leipzig. But the fall of the Berlin Wall was to become <laughs> the symbol of the strive for freedom of the people of Germany and for that matter for the people of the entire world. And then the rest is history, as one would say. It only took us not even 11 months, not even 11 months, from that moment of the fall of the Berlin Wall to reunification of Germany. And that's probably the most important thing to say. This reunification of Germany, contrary to the unification of Germany first in 1871, which was done in Versailles to humiliate the French, was done with the consent, the explicit consent of all our neighbors and all our partners. Only 11 months. 
And now what does that mean, or what did that mean for South Africa? This, I would say, best single moment in the thousand-year-old history of Germany. What did that mean for South Africa? And Mr. President, when we were sitting next door, we just chatted a little bit about that, that moment. What did it mean? What? There's one person who can give us an answer to that, uh, to that question I'm going to pose to you. And he has given that answer to me. What do you think? What do you think the 2nd of February 1990, the historic speech of the President of the Republic of South Africa, almost exactly to the day 30 years ago, would have been possible about, would have been possible without the happiest moment in the history of Germany, the fall of the Berlin Wall? Maybe the, the, the president would want to give uh, the response himself. Uh, he has written about that in his autobiography. And I believe the answer is no. Because of the changes, the big changes in global politics, because of the strive of the East German freedom fighters and their peers in Poland, in Hungary, in the Czech Republic, in Czechoslovakia and elsewhere, change became possible in South Africa too, 8,000 kilometers away at the other end of the world, so to speak. And maybe the decision, the courageous decision that President de Klerk took at that very moment might have come later, maybe. Or it might not have come at all, because things would have changed afterwards. In history, you tend to have windows of opportunities that close before you realize that it's too late. Who knows? And I think uh, this link, this historical link between the will to freedom of the German people on the one hand side and the, I should like to say, Mr. President, revolutionary decision of yours to break down the walls in South Africa, because that's what it was, breaking down walls in South Africa, I think will bind our nations together forever. Why did that happen? And what was the reason for that? I think uh, there's nobody better place to say, say that than Mr. de Klerk as uh, the actor who took all those bold, bold decisions. But from my point of view, I believe one of the reasons why that became possible was that the retreat of the Soviet Union was something that gave South Africa space to breathe, took away some of the fear of the real and perceived fear that existed in South Africa at the times. But maybe most importantly, the myth, I think it was a myth, the myth of the ANC and the United Democratic Front of being nothing else, nothing else than the fifth column of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union was gone, was gone with the fall of the Berlin Wall. And I think that gave that also was one of the probably more important elements that gave this country a chance to breathe and to take the quantum leap it took to freedom and to a constitutional democracy. And it was President de Klerk who took that decision, I'm sure conscious of all the risks involved for his country, for his nation, for his people, but also for himself uh, personally. Now, what does that mean for both of us, the Germans and the South Africans? I think it means, and I've said that in my introduction, it means we have learned, we have the historical experience that history can turn out all right. History is not always something that befalls us, but we can shape it. And we can not only shape it, it has a good ending. We in Germany, we live the best moments of our history. We have never lived better. We live in peace, we live in prosperity, we live in tolerance, and we live in diversity. And in South Africa, the situation is the same. I would like to say, and 
maybe it's difficult because the closer you look at your own country and the more you're in it, the more difficult is it, is it to have a bird's eye perspective. But I would want to say that the last 25 years, maybe the last 30 years in South Africa, are probably also the best times of your history because of your constitutional democracy, because of the wish to once and for all not solve your conflicts between blacks and blacks and whites and whites and blacks and whites by violence and war, but to, to solve them by peaceful means. And I think that is the biggest gift that one can give to a nation. All this happened against the wisdom of all those political analysts who predicted that uh, reunification of Germany would never be possible without a bloodbath or a third world war or whatever. Peaceful change in South Africa, Mr. President, was possible, became possible against the, all the probabilities of all what the political analysts have said. Everybody, not everybody, most people predicted there will be a civil war. There was a situation that came pretty close to a civil war, I would say, in the middle of the 80s, with the state of emergencies. What was the result? There was bloodshed in South Africa, I must say. But there could have been a lot more blood being shed if South Africa had sunk into a real civil war between blacks and between whites. And the third lesson of history, I think, is that, and I think that's the greatest accomplishment and the greatest beacon of hope for the world, is that political leadership that has the vision and the courage and the timing can change history can change history to the better. So, without the Berlin Wall, without the fall of the Berlin Wall, possibly no speech, Mr. President, on the 2nd of February 1990. So, the destinies of our nations are bound together by that link. And they are bound forever, I believe. It's not only a reason to rejoice and to be happy and to remember but it's also a reason to be, to carry responsibility, to make sure that those moments, those moments in history when everything seemed possible, and we both proved that everything is possible, if we really wanted, that those moments are not forgotten, because they are important in those difficult and troublesome and messy times that I alluded to in my, in my introduction. That is what I wanted to say on the topic that Dave Stewart introduced. I, if you allow, please give me just a couple of minutes to say something about Germany and the way we have dealt with our disgraceful past. The 8th of May 1945, ladies and gentlemen, was a day of defeat when the Field Marshal, Field Marshal Keitel signed the unconditional surrender in uh, Berlin Karlshorst about 100 meters away from the house I lived in when I, uh, for the first time, lived in Berlin. But it was a day of liberation. The world helped us to liberate ourselves from the scourge of racism, of Nazism, of a ridiculous idea of racial superiority of the Aryans or the Germans, or however you call them, uh, against all the others. It liberated us from a war that we waged on the entire world that cost, at the end of the day, something like 50 or 60 million people's lives. And it destroyed, and it destroyed so many lives that, it's, that the pain and the sorrow and the disgrace is absolutely innumerable. And it needed the blood, sweat, and tears of the entire world to bring us down. Mr. President, I've told you, but I think it's a disgrace that we Germans were not able in 1945 to bring that change ourselves. We had our heroes, the heroes of the 20th of July of 1944, the ones that were willing to give their lives to kill Adolf Hitler and to bring an end to this nightmare. But they failed, and all the others failed too. So we needed you the world, including many South Africans, who were willing to give their lives and gave their lives to free us 
ourselves as Germans from the scourge of fascism. Germany was in 19, 1945 at moral ground zero. You couldn't sink deeper than we did. Not only the country was destroyed, that was terrible. And it was difficult for each and every one of those Germans that survived the war and the Nazi era. But we were at moral ground zero. Never in history before something like that happened, where a nation set, up, set itself up to stage a genocide upon another nation in the way it was done, in an industrial manner. Six million Jews gasified, killed, massacred. And I'm not talking here, well, I should talk about all the other neighbors that we killed in massacres, the Poles, the Ukrainians, the Russians, the French, the Dutch, the Belgians, etc. Now this, and I think that's my probably my most important point, we have had 75 years now to cope with this history, this history of evil. And for the first, I would say, 23 years, there was the law of silence in Germany. We started to face our past by signing reparation agreements. We tried our best to start again some kind of a relationship with the Jews of the world, with Israel for that matter. We established diplomatic relationship with Israel, I think in 1961 or 1962. But we weren't able and we weren't ripe and ripe yet to face our own demons, our own history. And it was only in 1968, 23 years after the end of the war, that the young boys and girls of Germany, the sons and daughters of the generation of the perpetrators, were fed up with that silence. And what is called now the revolution of 1968, which was in other countries, like in France, a revolution of students against some sort of a society which they thought was, was old and needed to be reformed. In Germany, it was a revolt against our own parents, mostly against our fathers. That is now 52 years ago, and it changed everything. Because since then, painfully, but consistently, we Germans learned to face our own history in its good parts and in its evil parts. And whoever has been to Berlin in the last 20 years sees testimony to that. I think Berlin is the only capital in the world where you see right in the heart of the city monuments which commemorate the worst parts of our history. You know, there's uh, the, the, the joke uh, of a Brit a British citizen who would go to Paris and look at all the monuments of the Napoleon, Napoleonic Wars and he would ask the French why would you have monuments here who display the defeat of the United Kingdom. Berlin, Berlin for that matter, we Germans are different. And that is not, and it's important to say that, because we Germans are better than others. We are not, we certainly are not. It is because the evil that was committed in our name and by our fathers and grandfathers was so big there was no way around it. You, people in psychology talk about the trauma of the victims and they talk about the trauma of the perpetrators. That they both is, both is right. And we tried ever since, probably mostly since the 60s, we tried to tackle our own trauma with the guilt and the responsibility we all carry as people of that nation that committed <coughs> those, <coughs> those crimes. We have come to accept, sorry, we have come to accept responsibility and also guilt <coughs> and we did, I think, the right thing to do. And I come here, and I should have said that before because that's my fourth disclaimer, I come here under the emotional under the emotional um, impression of the 22nd of January, which is the day of reconciliation between France and Germany, the hereditary enmity that we had for two centuries. I come here under the emotional impression of the 21st of January, the day of the liberation of the camp of Holocaust. And 
the commemoration of what we did to the European Jews. And I come here on the 31st of January 2020, which is today, when one nation decided to leave us this wonderful, beautiful, peaceful, prosperous project that was the European Union. They call that Brexit, I believe. <laughs> and we continental Europeans completely fail to understand, and I'm part of that, I don't understand it. Why, in those troubled times, someone would be willing to leave the most successful and most prosperous peace project, which is the European integration project that this world has ever seen. But we have to accept it. We must not, we need not understand it. We wish our friends of the United Kingdom all the best. And we hope that we can stay friends, even if they are not part of this integration project. I was about to say that I'm under the impact of those, for me, and I think for us Germans as a whole, meaningful, uh, meaningful dates uh, of commemoration and of looking into history. And I can say that it is good that we continue to face our demons in our history in the way we have done. And it is not only the moral right thing to do, but it's also in our interest. I consider it to be a miracle, Mr. President, that the country that committed the Shoah now is a fully fledged, responsible and respected member of the international community. Remember the United Nations in 1945 with the signature of Jan Smuts of the Republic of South Africa. When they signed the San Francisco on the 26th of June 1945, the United Nations Charter, there's a clause in it which says there's enemy states. And there were two enemy states, it was Germany and Japan. No one at that moment would have ever guessed that the country that brought that on the world would be some generations later a fully and respected member of the world community. And more so, and more so. We are, well, we are proud of it, rightfully or wrongfully. We, we are export world champions, are we not? And as South Africa uh, testifies to that, I think the, the 20 billion euros, the more than 300 billion rand of trade turnover with Germany is quite considerable. We are a little bit behind the Chinese. We are export world champions. We need open markets. We are a trading nation. We are an industrial nation that wants to export its products. And we are proud of it. But believe me, who would want to have trade with a country that refuses to acknowledge what had happened in the past? So in a sense, we, face, we are facing our past and we are letting our friends and partners be part of that process. And it is the morally right thing to do, and at the same time, it is in our interest to have done it. And I don't want to speak about other partnering and friendly nations here, but uh, I just want to give you just a little sentence about it. Look at the way that Japan is struggling with its history. Look at the, 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 the problems that, causes, that, that, is, that are caused by that 75 years after the end of the World War in, in Japan with the traumatic experience of the two atomic bombs being thrown on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and the problems they continue to have today with the demons of the past with their neighbors in South Korea, in China, and elsewhere. Now, um, I'm coming to add to the end of what I wanted to say. I thank you very much for the, for the patience you have had with me. I uh, want to uh, make a very careful and at the same time honest attempt to draw a couple of conclusions. Because uh, why did I say all that? Uh, we are not here to talk about German history. We, talk, we are here to talk about South African present and future, I believe, is the present. And if you allow me at the end of what I want to say, just allow me uh, four, maybe five sentences, really only sentences that I consider to be for me at least, possible, possible uh, conclusions. The first one would be nation building, nation building in any country, in any nation, but certainly in South Africa, where the inequalities and where the differences between the different constituencies of a nation are so big, 
need two things first and foremost, I think. They need trust in one another, and they need empathy. What do I mean by empathy? Empathy, I mean the honest will, as difficult as it might, might be, to try to understand the other. Where does he come from? Where does she come from? What are his or her traumatizing? What happened to him and to her in the past? <clears throat> the second thing a nation needs is a common vision, of course. We need a common vision to build a proper and healthy nation, to have a common understanding on where we want to go to. And I think South Africa, with the interim constitution, and another constitution of 1996, has a very clear and a wonderfully progressive piece of paper that paves the way along the values that we, in Germany and in Europe, share 100%. But to have a common vision of the future, I think it's also important to have a common view of your past. And that is maybe not as difficult as in Germany, and it certainly is different, but it is as important as it is in Germany. My third point is, and I'm quoting a historian from Israel who says, remembrance does not have an expiry date. And he means by that, never, never there is a final stroke under dealing with your past. It cannot be. Certainly not for Germans, but I think that holds true for, for everybody. So uh, in the context of South Africa, I would like to say the truth and reconciliation commission that was being put in place very courageously at a moment when you know the, the South African past was an open wound, a lot more than it is today. Still, today it continues to be an open wound, I believe. Cannot be. I would even say must not be the final stroke. You know, we talked about that finish over and clap. There's no more debate to be had about that, because I think that would mean that some in this country lack the empathy it needs to build a nation, because for many in this country, the past is still and continues to be an open, an open wound. So fourth remark, be courageous, be brave in facing the demons of your past. Talk about them. Try to understand what moves the other. Don't swallow your feelings down your throat. Share them with others. And my last remark before I stop is, and that is something that uh, I have thought quite carefully about whether I'm going to say that or not. But I think I want to say it. There is, uh, if you read the newspapers in recent days, there's an, the High Court of Johannesburg opened the trial to see what happened to one of the victims of the apartheid regime, to the agent. You might have followed that in the media. And there's a lot of agitation around that. You can feel that there's people, not only the family of Neil, but also people around him, people that shared his political vision at the time, that you don't need to share. But I think to to have a good future in South Africa, it is important, once again, to understand and to acknowledge and to recognize what happened and to continue to believe that that is important for the present and the future of South Africa. So if there were people in South Africa who were part of the government, who were part of those that uh, benefited from those times. And if those people were <coughs> able and willing to express their understanding for the continued grief and sorrow that people in this country feel for the loved ones they lost, I think it would be a great step forward. I uh, am very grateful for the patience that you have uh, given to me. I hope I don't have bore, I have not bored you too much. I am very much looking forward to the contributions of all the others and uh, to the 
debate we're going to have. If anybody would want to ask me a question or would uh, uh, react to what I said, I would be very happy. Thank you very much, Mr. President. <laughs>